story eleven of the bet and other stories by anton chekhov this librivox recording is in the public domain story eleven expensive lessons it is a great bore for an educated person not to know foreign languages Vorotov felt it strongly when on leaving the university after he had got his degree he occupied himself with a little scientific research it's awful he used to say losing his breath for although only twenty-six he was stout heavy and short of breath it's awful without knowing languages i'm like a bird without wings i'll simply have to chuck the work so he decided come what might to conquer his natural laziness and to study french and german and he began to look out for a teacher one winter afternoon as vorotov sat working in his study the servant announced a lady to see him show her in said vorotov and a young lady exquisitely dressed in the latest fashion entered the study she introduced herself as alice osipovna Enket, a teacher of french and said that a friend of vorotov's had sent her to him very glad sit down said vorotov losing his breath and clutching at the collar of his nightshirt he always worked in a nightshirt in order to breathe more easily you were sent to me by peter sergeyevich yes yes i asked him very glad while he discussed the matter with mademoiselle enquette he glanced at her shyly with curiosity she was a genuine frenchwoman very elegant and still quite young from her pale and languid face from her short curly hair and unnaturally small waist you would not think her more than eighteen but looking at her broad well-developed shoulders her charming back and severe eyes vorotov decided that she was certainly not less than twenty-three perhaps even twenty-five but then again it seemed to him that she was only eighteen her face had the cold business-like expression of one who had come to discuss a business matter never once did she smile or frown and only once a look of perplexity flashed into her eyes when she discovered that she was not asked to teach children but a grown-up stout young man so alice osipovna vorotov said to her you will give me a lesson daily from seven to eight o'clock in the evening with regard to your wish to receive a rouble a lesson i have no objection at all a rouble well let it be a rouble and he went on asking her if she wanted tea or coffee if the weather was fine and smiling good-naturedly stroking the tablecloth with the palm of his hand he asked her kindly who she was where she had completed her education and how she earned her living in a cold business-like tone alice osipovna answered that she had completed her education at a private school and had then qualified as a domestic teacher that her father had died recently of scarlet fever her mother was alive and made artificial flowers that she mademoiselle enquette gave private lessons at a pension in the morning and from one o'clock right until the evening she taught in respectable private houses she went leaving a slight and almost imperceptible perfume of a woman's dress behind her vorotov did not work for a long time afterwards but sat at the table stroking the green cloth and thinking it's very pleasant to see girls earning their own living he thought on the other hand it is very unpleasant to realize that poverty does not spare even such elegant and pretty girls as alice osipovna she too must struggle for her existence rotten luck having never seen virtuous frenchwomen he also thought that this exquisitely dressed alice osipovna with her well-developed shoulders and unnaturally small waist was in all probability engaged in something else besides teaching next evening when the clock pointed to five minutes to seven alice osipovna arrived rosy from the cold she opened margot an elementary text-book and began without any preamble the french grammar has twenty-six letters the first is called a ah, the second be pardon interrupted vorotov smiling i must warn you mademoiselle that you will have to change your methods somewhat in my case the fact is that i know russian latin and greek very well i have studied comparative philology and it seems to me that we may leave out margot and begin straight off to read some author 
and he explained to the frenchwoman how grown-up people study languages a friend of mine said he who wished to know modern languages put a french german and latin gospel in front of him and then minutely analyzed one word after another the result he achieved his purpose in less than a year let us take some author and start reading the frenchwoman gave him a puzzled look it was evident that vorotov's proposal appeared to her naive and absurd if he had not been grown up she would have certainly have got angry and stormed at him but as he was a very stout adult man at whom she could not storm she only shrugged her shoulders half perceptibly and said just as you please vorotov ransacked his bookshelves and produced a ragged french book will this do he asked oh it's all the same in that case let us begin let us start from the title memoir reminiscences translated mademoiselle enquette reminiscences repeated vorotov smiling good-naturedly and breathing heavily he passed a quarter of an hour over the word memoir and the same with the word de this tired alice osipovna out she answered his questions carelessly got confused and evidently neither understood her pupil nor tried to vorotov asked her questions and at the same time glanced furtively at her fair hair thinking the hair is not naturally curly she waves it marvellous she works from morning till night and yet she finds time to wave her hair at eight o'clock sharp she got up gave him a dry cold revoir monsieur and left the study after her lingered the same sweet subtle agitating perfume the pupil again did nothing for a long time but sat by the table and thought during the following days he became convinced that his teacher was a charming girl serious and punctual but very uneducated and incapable of teaching grown-up people so he decided he would not waste his time but part with her and engage someone else when she came for the seventh lesson he took an envelope containing seven roubles out of his pocket holding it in his hands and blushing furiously he began i am sorry alice osipovna but i must tell you i am placed in an awkward position the frenchwoman glanced at the envelope and guessed what was the matter for the first time during the lessons a shiver passed over her face and the cold business-like expression disappeared she reddened faintly and casting her eyes down began to play absently with her thin gold chain and vorotov noticing her confusion understood how precious this rouble was to her how hard it would be for her to lose this money i must tell you he murmured getting still more confused his heart gave a thump quickly he put the envelope back into his pocket and continued uh, excuse me i will leave you for ten minutes and as though he did not want to dismiss her at all but had only asked permission to retire for a moment he went into another room and sat there for ten minutes then he returned more confused than ever he thought that his leaving her like that would be explained by her in a certain way and this made him awkward the lessons began again vorotov wanted them no more knowing that they would lead to nothing he gave the frenchwoman a free hand he did not question or interrupt her any more she translated at her own sweet will ten pages a lesson but he did not listen he breathed heavily and for want of occupation gazed now and then at her curly little head her neck her soft white hands and inhaled the perfume of her dress he caught himself thinking about her as he ought not and it shamed him for admiring her and then he felt aggrieved and angry because she behaved so coldly towards him in such a business-like way never smiling and as if afraid that he might suddenly touch her all the while he thought how could he inspire her with confidence in him how could he get to know her better to help her to make her realize how badly she taught poor little soul once alice osipovna came to the lesson in a dainty pink dress a little decollete and such a sweet scent came from her that you might have thought she was wrapped in a cloud that you had only to blow on her for her to fly away or dissolve like smoke 
she apologized saying she could only stay for half an hour because she had to go straight from the lesson to a ball he gazed at her neck at her bare shoulders and he thought he understood why french women were known to be light-minded and easily won he was drowned in this cloud of scent beauty and nudity and she quite unaware of his thoughts and probably not in the least interested in them read over the pages quickly and translated full steam ahead he walked over the street and met the gentleman of his friend and said where do you rush seeing your face so pale it makes me pain the memoirs had been finished long ago alice was now translating another book once she came to the lesson an hour earlier apologizing because she had to go to the little theatre at seven o'clock when the lesson was over vorotov dressed and he too went to the theatre it seemed to him only for the sake of rest and distraction and he did not even think of alice he would not admit that a serious man preparing for a scientific career a stay-at-home should brush aside his book and rush to the theatre for the sake of meeting an unintellectual stupid girl whom he hardly knew but somehow during the interval his heart beat and without noticing it he ran about the foyer and the corridors like a boy looking impatiently for some one every time the interval was over he was tired but when he discovered the familiar pink dress and the lovely shoulders veiled with tall his heart jumped as if from a presentiment of happiness he smiled joyfully and for the first time in his life he felt jealous alice was with two ugly students and an officer she was laughing talking loudly and evidently flirting Boratov had never seen her like that apparently she was happy contented natural warm why what was the reason perhaps because these people were dear to her and belonged to the same class as she Boratov felt the huge abyss between him and that class he bowed to his teacher but she nodded coldly and quietly passed by it was plain she did not want her cavaliers to know that she had pupils and gave lessons because she was poor after the meeting at the theatre vorotov knew that he was in love during lessons that followed he devoured his elegant teacher with his eyes and no longer struggling he gave full rein to his pure and impure thoughts alice's face was always cold exactly at eight o'clock every evening she said calmly au revoir monsieur and he felt that she was indifferent to him and would remain indifferent that his position was hopeless sometimes in the middle of a lesson he would begin dreaming hoping building plans he composed an amorous declaration remembering that french women were frivolous and complacent but he had only to give his teacher one glance for his thoughts to be blown out like a candle when you carry it on to the veranda of a bungalow and the wind is blowing once overcome forgetting everything in a frenzy he could stand it no longer he barred her way when she came from the study into the hall after the lesson and losing his breath and stammering began to declare his love you are dear to me i love you please let me speak alice grew pale probably she was afraid that after this declaration she would not be able to come to him any more and receive a rouble a lesson she looked at him with terrified eyes and began in a loud whisper oh it is impossible do not speak i beg you impossible afterwards vorotov did not sleep all night he tortured himself with shame abused himself thinking feverishly he thought that his declaration had offended the girl and that she would not come any more he made up his mind to find out where she lived from the address bureau and to write her an apology but alice came without the letter for a moment she felt awkward and then opened the book and began to translate quickly in an animated voice as always oh young gentleman do not rend these flowers in my garden which i want to give to my sick daughter she still goes 
four books have been translated by now but vorotov knows nothing beyond the word memoir and when he is asked about his scientific research work he waves his hand leaves the question unanswered and begins to talk about the weather End of story eleven. Story twelve of the Bet and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story twelve: A Living Calendar. State Councillor Sharamikin's drawing room is wrapped in a pleasant half darkness the big bronze lamp with the green shade makes the walls the furniture the faces all green couleur nuit de grain occasionally a smouldering log flares up in the dying fire and for a moment casts a red glow over the faces but this does not spoil the general harmony of light the general tone as the painters say is well sustained sheremikin sits in a chair in front of the fireplace in the attitude of a man who has just dined he is an elderly man with a high official's grey side whiskers and meek blue eyes tenderness is shed over his face and his lips are set in a melancholy smile at his feet stretched out lazily with his legs toward the fireplace vice governor lipniev sits on a little stool he is a brave-looking man of about forty sheremikin's children are moving about round the piano nina kolya nadya and vanya the door leading to madame sheremikin's room is slightly open and the light breaks through timidly there behind the door sits sheremikin's wife anna pavlovna in front of her writing-table she is president of the local ladies committee a lively piquant lady of thirty years and a little bit over through her pince-nez her vivacious black eyes are running over the pages of a french novel beneath the novel lies a tattered copy of the report of the committee for last year formerly our town was much better off in these things says sheremikin screwing up his meek eyes at the glowing coals never a winter passed but some star would pay us a visit famous actors and singers used to come but now besides acrobats and organ grinders the devil only knows what comes there's no aesthetic pleasure at all we might be living in a forest yes and does your excellency remember that italian tragedian what's his name he was so dark and tall uh, let me think oh yes luigi ernesto di ruggiero remarkable talent and strength he had only to say one word and the whole theatre was on the quivive my darling anna used to take a great interest in his talent she hired the theatre for him and sold tickets for the performances in advance in return he taught her elocution and gesture a first-rate fellow he came here to be quite exact twelve years ago oh no that's not true less ten years anna dear how old is our nina she'll be ten next birthday calls anna pavlovna from her room why oh nothing in particular my dear i was just curious and good singers used to come do you remember polipchen the tenore di grazia what a charming fellow he was how good-looking fair a very expressive face parisian manners and what a voice your excellency only one weakness he would sing some notes with his stomach and would take re falsetto otherwise everything was good tamberlick he said had taught him my dear anna and i hired a hall for him at the social club and in gratitude for that he used to sing to us for whole days and nights he taught dear anna to sing he came i remember it as though it were last night in lent some twelve years ago no it's more how bad my memory is getting heaven help me anna dear how old is our darling nadja twelve twelve then we've got to add ten months that makes it exact thirteen somehow there used to be more life in our town then take for instance the charity soirees what enjoyable soirees we used to have before how elegant there were singing playing and recitation after the war i remember when the turkish prisoners were here dear anna arranged a soiree on behalf of the wounded 
we collected eleven hundred roubles i remember the turkish officers were passionately fond of dear anna's voice and kissed her hand incessantly ah asiatics but a grateful nation would you believe me the soiree was such a success that i wrote an account of it in my diary it was um, i remember it as though it had only just happened in seventy six no in seventy seven no pray when were the turks here anna dear how old is our little kolya i'm seven papa says kolya a brat with a swarthy face and coal black hair yes we're old and we've lost the energy we used to have lopniev agreed with a sigh that's the real cause old age my friend no new moving spirits arrive and the old ones grow old the old fire is dull now when i was younger i did not like company to be bored i was your anna pavlovna's first assistant whether it was a charity soiree or a tambola to support a star who was going to arrive whatever anna pavlovna was arranging i used to throw over everything and began to bustle about one winter i remember i bustled and ran so much that i even got ill i shan't forget that winter do you remember what a performance we arranged with anna pavlovna in aid of the victims of the fire what year was it oh not so very long ago in uh, seventy nine no in, in eighty i believe tell me how old is your vanya five anna pavlovna calls from the study well that means it was six years ago yes my dear friend that was a time it's all over now the old fire's quite gone lipniev and sheremikin grew thoughtful the smouldering log flares up for the last time and then is covered in ash end of story twelve story thirteen of the bet and other stories by anton chekhov this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirteen old age state councillor usikov architect arrived in his native town where he had been summoned to restore the cemetery church he was born in the town he had grown up and been married there and yet when he got out of the train he hardly recognized it everything was changed for instance eighteen years ago when he left the town to settle in petersburg where the railway station is now boys used to hunt for marmots now as you come into the high street there is a four-storied hotel vienna with apartments where there was of old an ugly grey fence but not the fence or the houses or anything had changed so much as the people questioning the hall porter Uzilkov discovered that more than half of the people he remembered were dead or paupers or forgotten do you remember Uzilkov? he asked the porter Uzilkov, the architect who divorced his wife he had a house in shrivbeth street surely you remember no i don't remember any one of the name why it's impossible not to remember it was an exciting case all the cabmen knew even try to remember his divorce was managed by the attorney shapkin the swindler the notorious sharper the man who was thrashed at the dub you mean ivan nikhailovich yes is he alive dead thank heaven his honour's alive his honour's a notary now with an office well to do two houses in kapichny street just lately married his daughter off Uzilkov strode from one corner of the room to another an idea flashed into his mind from boredom he decided to see shapkin it was afternoon when he left the hotel and quietly walked to kirpichny street he found shapkin in his office and hardly recognized him from the well-built alert attorney with a quick impudent perpetually tipsy expression shapkin had become a modest grey-haired shrunken old man you don't recognize me you have forgotten Uzilkev began i'm your old client Uzilkev. Uzilkov? which Uzilkov? ah remembrance came to shapkin he recognized him and was confused began exclamations questions recollections oh never expected never thought 
chuckled shapkin what will you have would you like champagne perhaps you'd like oysters my dear man what a lot of money i got out of you in the old days so much that i can't think what i ought to stand you please don't trouble said usilkov i haven't time i must go to the cemetery and examine the church i have a commission splendid we'll have something to eat and a drink and go together i've got some splendid horses i'll take you there and introduce you to the churchwarden i'll fix up everything but what's the matter my dearest man you're not avoiding me not afraid please sit nearer there's nothing to be afraid of now long ago i really was pretty sharp a bit of a rogue but now i'm quieter than water humbler than grass i've grown old got a family there are children time to die the friends had something to eat and drink and went in a coach and pair to the cemetery yes it was a good time shapkin was reminiscent sitting in the sledge i remember but i simply can't believe it do you remember how you divorced your wife it's almost twenty years ago and you've probably forgotten everything but i remember it as though i conducted the petition yesterday my god how rotten i was then i was a smart casuistical devil full of sharp practice and devilry and i used to run into some pretty shady affairs particularly when there was a good fee as in your case for instance what was it you paid me then five six hundred enough to upset anybody by the time you left for petersburg you'd left the whole affair completely in my hands do what you like and your former wife sophia mikhailovna though she did come from a merchant family was proud and selfish to bribe her to take the guilt on herself was difficult extremely difficult i used to come to her for a business talk and when she saw me she would say to her maid masha surely i told you i wasn't at home to scoundrels i tried one way and then another wrote letters to her tried to meet her accidentally no good i had to work through a third person for a long time i had trouble with her and she only yielded when you agreed to give her ten thousand she could not stand out against ten thousand she succumbed she began to weep spat in my face but she yielded and took the guilt on herself if i remember it was fifteen not ten thousand she took from me said uzilkov uh, yes of course fifteen my mistake shapkin was disconcerted anyway it's all past and done with now why shouldn't i confess frankly ten i gave to her and the remaining five i bargained out of you for my own share i deceived both of you it's all past why be ashamed of it and who else was there to take from boris petrovich if not from you i ask you you were rich and well-to-do you married in caprice you were divorced in caprice you were making a fortune i remember you got twenty thousand out of a single contract whom was i to tap if not you and i must confess i was tortured by envy if you got hold of a nice lot of money people would take off their hats to you but the same people would beat me for shillings and smack my face in the club but why recall it it's time to forget uh, tell me please how did sophia mikhailovna live afterwards with her ten thousand on a peu plus badly god knows whether it was frenzy or pride and conscience that tortured her because she had sold herself for money or perhaps she loved you but she took to drink you know she received the money and began to gad about with officers and troikas drunkenness philandering debauchery she would come into a tavern with an officer and instead of port or a light wine she would drink the strongest cognac to drive her into a frenzy yes she was eccentric i suffered enough with her she would take offence at some trifle and then get nervous and what happened afterwards well a week passed a fortnight i was sitting at home writing suddenly the door opened and she comes in take your cursed money she said and threw the parcel in my face she could not resist it five hundred were missing she had only got rid of five hundred and what did you do with the money oh it's all past and done with what's the good of concealing it i certainly took it what are you staring at me like that for wait for the sequel 
it's a complete novel the sickness of a soul two months passed by one night i came home drunk in a wicked mood i turned on the light and saw sophia mikhailovna sitting on my sofa drunk too wandering a bit with something savage in her face as if she had just escaped from the madhouse give me my money back she said i've changed my mind if i'm going to the dogs i want to go madly passionately make haste you scoundrel give me the money how indecent it was and you did you give it her i remember i gave her ten roubles oh is it possible usilka frowned if you couldn't do it yourself or you didn't want to you could have written to me and i didn't know i didn't know my dear man why should i write when she wrote herself afterwards when she was in hospital i was so taken up with the new marriage that i paid no attention to letters but you were an outsider you had no antagonism to sophia mikhailovna why didn't you help her we can't judge by our present standards boris petrovitch now we think in this way but then we thought quite differently now i might perhaps give her a thousand roubles but then even ten roubles she didn't get them for nothing it's a terrible story it's time to forget but here you are the sledge stopped at the churchyard gate usilkov and shapkin got out of the sledge went through the gate and walked along a long broad avenue the bare cherry trees the acacias the grey crosses and monuments sparkled with hoar-frost in each flake of snow the bright sunny day was reflected there was the smell you find in all cemeteries of incense and fresh dug earth you have a beautiful cemetery said usilkov it's almost an orchard yes but it's a pity the thieves steal the monuments look there behind that cast-iron memorial on the right sophia mikhailovna is buried would you like to see the friends turned to the right stepping in deep snow towards the cast-iron memorial down here said shapkin pointing to a little stone of white marble some subaltern or other put up the monument on her grave usilkov slowly took off his hat and showed his bald pate to the snow eyeing him shapkin also took off his hat and another baldness shone beneath the sun the silence round about was like the tomb as though the air were dead too the friends looked at the stone silent thinking she is asleep shapkin broke the silence and she cares very little that she took the guilt upon herself and drank cognac confess boris petrovitch what asked usilkov sternly that however loathsome the past may be it's better than this and shapkin pointed to his grey hairs in the old days i did not even think of death if i'd met her i would have circumvented her but now well now sadness took hold of usilkov suddenly he wanted to cry passionately as he once desired to love and he felt that these tears would be exquisite refreshing moisture came out of his eyes and a lump rose in his throat but shapkin was standing by his side and usilkov felt ashamed of his weakness before a witness he turned back quickly and walked toward the church two hours later having arranged with the churchwarden and examined the church he seized the opportunity while shapkin was talking away to the priest and ran to shed a tear he walked to the stone surreptitiously with stealthy steps looking round all the time the little white monument stared at him absently so sadly and innocently as though a girl and not a wanton divorcee were beneath if i could weep could weep thought usilkov but the moment for weeping had been lost though the old man managed to make his eyes shine and tried to bring himself to the right pitch the tears did not flow and the lump did not rise in his throat after waiting for about ten minutes usilkov waved his arm and went to look for shapkin end of story thirteen end of the bet and other stories by anton chekhov translated by s s kotelyansky and others